After spending all this time on female pathology, let's switch over to male reproductive pathology. Inflammation of the prostate, or prostatitis, is characterized by dysuria, frequency, urgency, and lower back pain, almost like a UTI. This is probably the most basic piece of prostate pathology to know. Acute prostatitis can be caused by the usual UTI bacterial suspects, like E. coli, Klebsiella, and Proteus mirabilis. In contrast, chronic prostatitis is often abacterial and is also known as chronic pelvic pain syndrome. Benign prostatic hyperplasia, or BPH, is a common enlargement in the prostate gland of older men. The prostate, to some extent, is under the control of dihydrotestosterone, which is why the drug finasteride is effective in this condition. Finasteride blocks the conversion of testosterone to DHT, decreasing enlargement of the gland. In terms of location of the pathology, BPH is characterized by a nodular enlargement of the periurethral lobes in the lateral and middle parts of the prostate. As you can see from the image, BPH occurs in the area directly around the urethra, which can then compress it into a slit. This is in contrast to prostate cancer, which typically occurs in the posterior lobe. As you would imagine, the prostate cancer would have to be quite significant to compress the urethra. BPH compression of the urethra can lead to increased urinary frequency, nocturia, difficulty starting and stopping the stream of urine, and painful urination. If the prostate significantly blocks the urethra, urinary retention can occur, distending the bladder and causing bladder hypertrophy. If urine backs up further, it can cause hydronephrosis and UTIs. One very important fact to know is that BPH is not considered a premalignant lesion, but it can cause an increase in PSA levels, or prostate-specific antigen. And as you know, we use PSA in the screening and diagnosis of prostate cancer, though the future of the test is now in doubt due to a recent study showing no significant correlation between PSA levels and cancer. Nevertheless, PSA is good for monitoring the efficacy of prostate cancer treatment and detecting potential recurrences. Other than finasteride, alpha-1 antagonists like terazosin and tamsulosin can also be used to treat BPH. The alpha-1 antagonists work by relaxing smooth muscle, thereby releasing pressure on the urethra. Prostate cancer, like BPH, is a disease of older men, most commonly those over 50. As we just mentioned, about 70% of the time, these tumors are located in the posterior lobe or the peripheral zone of the prostate, potentially making them palpable by a digital rectal exam. On histology, you can see the infiltrating glands with large nuclei. This image is specifically adenocarcinoma, which is the most common type of prostate cancer. The more disorganized and the fewer glands there are, the higher the Gleason score and the worse the prognosis. As we mentioned earlier, PSA is the classic tumor marker for prostate cancer. Prostatic acid phosphatase is an older marker that was widely used until the 80s when PSA took over as the preferred marker for diagnosis. As opposed to BPH, the ratio of free unbound to total PSA is decreased in patients with prostate cancer. By the way, where else will you see increased PSA? Other conditions include prostatitis, the digital rectal exam itself, biking, and recent ejaculation. So essentially, it's recommended that men don't ejaculate within 24 hours before a PSA test. Once prostate cancer metastasizes, you can classically find lesions in the lower vertebrae, so you get lower back pain, as well as an increase in serum alkaline phosphatase. While many cancers that metastasize to the bone are osteoclastic, prostate cancer is osteoblastic. If you see a question involving an older male with recent lower back pain and any suspicious urinary symptoms or other symptoms of cancer, such as recent weight loss, your mind should immediately go to prostate cancer. The name cryptoorchidism comes from the Greek words crypto, meaning hidden, and orchid, meaning testicle. It occurs when a testis, or both testes, do not descend into the scrotum. Because of the increased body temperature, these testicles lack spermatogenesis. So what does that cause? That tends to cause problems with fertility. You also want to keep in mind that this disease is associated with an increased risk of developing germ cell tumors. We'll discuss these more in a minute. Another benign condition you'll want to be knowledgeable about is varicocele, which describes dilated veins in the pempiniform plexus due to increased venous pressure. It's usually seen on the left side. This is due to increased resistance to flow due to the left testicular vein's connection to the renal vein versus the right testicular vein's direct connection to the IVC. In long-standing cases, it can lead to decreased fertility due to increased temperature. As you can see here, almost all testicular tumors are germ cell tumors. Of the testicular germ cell tumors, seminomas are the most common type and occur most frequently in males 15 to 35 years old. Seminomas are malignant and they tend to show up as a painless mass. However, you can get some lower back pain if they metastasize to the lower peritoneum. 
Histologically, they appear as large cells in lobules with watery cytoplasm and have a classic fried egg appearance. As seen in this image, they can grow to be quite large. Even though these lesions are malignant, they are generally very responsive to radiation therapy. If they metastasize, they tend to do so late. Hence, seminomas tend to be associated with a good prognosis. Embryonal carcinomas, in contrast, are painful and are associated with a worse prognosis, with about a third to a half of patients presenting with METs at the time of diagnosis. These tumors tend to be undifferentiated, glandular, and papillary in morphology. They are often mixed with other non-seminoma tumor types like yolk sac tumors. You can find increased AFP and increased HCG levels with this condition, but these markers are coming from the other tumor types and are not from the embryonal carcinoma tissue itself. Yolk sac tumors in males are analogous to the ovarian yolk sac tumors in females that we discussed earlier. They are also associated with an elevated AFP level and also have the Schiller-Duval bodies we mentioned before, which resemble primitive glomeruli. Choriocarcinomas are caused by disordered syncytiotrophoblast and cytotrophoblast elements. They have an elevated HCG and spread hematogenously. So now let's talk about teratomas. Teratomas in males are most often malignant compared to the benign dermoid cysts in females. As seen in this image, the tumor is heterogeneous and contains different types of tissue. So to recap, seminoma is the most common type of testicular germ cell tumor and makes up about one half of all testicular germ cell tumors. After that, you have mixed germ cell tumors, which includes all these non-seminomatous tumor types that we just discussed. These make up about one-third of all testicular germ cell tumors, with the remaining being pure versions of these tumor types. The non-germ cell tumors make up the other 5% of testicular tumors, and thankfully they're mostly benign, with the exception of testicular lymphoma. They can be composed of Leydig cells or Sertoli cells, in which case they're called sex cord stromal cell tumors. Leydig cells secrete androgens and can cause precocious puberty in boys. In some cases, they can also secrete estrogen and cause gynecomastia. Classically, these tumors have a golden brown color. Sertoli cell tumors can also secrete estrogen, leading to gynecomastia and impotence. As I mentioned, there are also lymphomas in the testicles, and testicular lymphoma is the most common testicular cancer in men over 60. This is almost always non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and the most common type is diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Tunica vaginalis lesions are lesions that occur in the serous covering of the testes and present as a testicular mass, so of course the concern here would be cancer. If a patient comes to you with an enlarged testicle after palpation, what's the next test you should do? The initial test should be transillumination. While tunica vaginalis lesions can be transilluminated, testicular tumors cannot. So let's take a look at a couple of these lesion types. Hydrocele's are fluid-filled sacs along the spermatic cord within the scrotum, and they occur when there is incomplete fusion of the processus vaginalis. Spermatocele is a dilated epididymal duct that results from epididymitis, or physical trauma, to the epididymis. So what's different about the fluid in the spermatocele compared with that in the hydrocele? As the tumor name suggests, the fluid in the spermatocele contains spermatozoa. Lastly, we'll discuss penile pathology. Starting with squamous cell carcinoma, this cancer of the penis is most common in Asia, Africa, and South America. It's associated with Bowen's disease, HPV infection, and lack of circumcision. Peyronie's disease is not neoplastic. As you can see, it manifests as a bent or curved shaft occurring secondary to fibrous tissue formation in the tunica albuginea. In fact, this condition is also known as chronic inflammation of the tunica albuginea. Priapism is a painful erection lasting longer than normal that isn't related to any sort of sexual stimulation. It's often seen in trauma or sickle cell disease, and also secondary to use of certain medications, such as anticoagulants, PDE5 inhibitors, antidepressants, alpha blockers, and cocaine. Okay, so that wraps up the reproductive pathology section. I know it's a ton of info, but hopefully you survived, and after a snack and a trip to the restroom, you'll be ready to tackle the next section, pharmacology.